I will introduce to you Yogesh Gori and Fruk Jiwa who are uh, with the Cody Institute. Yogesh leads our inclusive economies area of work and is the senior program staff with Cody. And uh, Farouk is joining us as an associate with the Cody Institute, and we're very happy to be here with them this morning. So at this point in time, I'll pass it right over to you, Yogesh, so that we might get started. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. And, and thank you for your support in, in getting uh, all the activities on future of work and workers going. And I see God as well here. So thank you, God, uh, for your support. Uh, you know, we started uh, these kitchen table dialogues back in uh, back in June, uh, and it was there was a reason why we called it uh, kitchen table uh, dialogues, because of the history of these kitchen table meetings uh, to the region. Uh, so almost 100 years back, uh, 1920s and 30s, when this uh, region of Canada was uh, facing uh, economic hardships uh, and including the the Great Depression, uh, the university um, went out to community. Uh, Moses Cody, Father Moses Cody, and colleagues went out to the community. Uh, not to talk about uh, the problems, obviously they discuss the problem, but but to talk to the, the farmers, the fishermen, uh, um, how they can overcome these uh, challenges. And those meetings actually happened around a kitchen table. Uh, once the miner had come back from the work and the farmer had come back work, uh, from work, they used to have, uh, they used to talk about the problems, but how to uh, overcome those problems. And those kitchen table dialogues led to a revolution. Uh, we call it anti ganesh movement, but that was a, a moment for social and economic justice for the local community here. And that converted into a, a, a series of uh, cooperatives, uh, producer cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, credit unions that got this local economy going once, uh, once again. So at the time of this pandemic, uh, when we saw the same, if, if, I, if you can um, switch off your mic, that would be good, yeah. Then we thought that we, uh, and, and, and people started talking about building back better, doing a big reset, and, and, um, and, and, and about the future, uh, future of uh, work. And that's when we started to sort of re-engage with, uh, with our constituency, with our graduates, partners, to talk about future. And that's how this series started. Farooq, me, and Jamie, we started this in, in June. This is our 10th. And, and this is our final uh, series for this year. Series will continue. This is the final webinar for 2020. Uh, and we so far uh, had over, have over 1,000 people register, show an interest, and, and join us. And uh, these conversations um, uh, uh, told us a lot in, in terms of uh, what is going on, uh, on, on about future of work. And in our course that we started in, in September, we have seen the history of work. We have seen the history of workers. We dug deep into, uh, into technology, how, how that is going to change uh, the future of work. So that all is done. We talked about policy. We'll talk, we talked about inclusion, everything we have discussed in the last 10 webinars and in the course. Today, so we, we have done all the hard aspect. We have done all the hard talking. Today, we're going to talk from the heart. And one we, speaker we have is going to talk about work, um, uh, and and what what is the what is the meaning of uh, of work? So without further ado, without talking much, I'm going to shut down and I'll let Farooq uh, to come and introduce our esteemed speaker and take on the conversation from there. And as Jamie said, please keep on your introductions in the chat box and your reflections and questions as well. Welcome, Rudy, and over to you, Farooq. Fantastic. Thank you, Yogesh. Thanks for teeing that up. Uh, it's, it's a real privilege to have you with us here, Rudy, and uh, I just wanted to add one or two things, you know, just to kind of round out that context before we actually get into the conversation. I think the reason we wanted to have you come in to speak to us before we kind of end this year uh, is, is because, you, you know, you've spent your entire career in the space of human resource development. You've, you know, you've built a very successful company in this field, and we were very keen to understand a little bit more about, you know, that very interesting relationship between an employer and an employee. We've been talking a lot about the future of work and workers, and no matter what the future looks like, there will always be that relationship between a worker and a workplace. So we, we thought, some, you know, who better to speak to than someone who's got a 30-year track record in this, very successfully having done things, but also who's had interesting twists and turns in their own career, in their own lives, who's introspective, <clears throat> and we thought that might be a nice way to, to kind of, you know, round out the conversation for this year. The second thing I want to say, and I want to say it up, up front, is 
Rudy, you've not just uh, you know, told us, but you've actually encouraged us to stretch the boundaries of the questions to you. You've given us the license to, uh, to ask some questions and go into, and into areas that are sometimes going to be uncomfortable or challenging. So I don't want anybody to be shocked or scandalized by the, by the manner of, of, of our conversation today, the tone that we might take or the questions we might ask. We're doing this with, uh, with the full permission and um, encouragement of Rudy. And we're doing this primarily so that we can find opportunities for doing some more learning as well. So unless you've changed your mind, Rudy, um, are you ready? I'm, I'm at your disposal, dude. Fantastic. Um, I think the best way to begin is to begin at the beginning. So Rudy, a lot of people don't know about you and I think it might be good to start from, from where you came from. Now you were born to a very humble family in, on, on the coast of Kenya in Mombasa. You grew up there. Tell us a little bit about what, was, what it was like growing up. What, what was life like for you before you, you immigrated to Canada? Mombasa was heaven on earth. It was a wonderful town back in the 50s and 60s, extremely safe, uh, highly integrated, I went to, there was a system of schools there called the Aga Khan schools. I was in the kindergarten primary. And when I was in the secondary school, there was the disruption that took place in East African countries, Idi Amin expelled the Asians, uh, Nyerere nationalized uh, Asian real estate. My parents got scared. Uh, we had some family in London, some family in Canada. And I noticed in the comments that people from Ethiopia and Uganda, my wife is from Uganda. I know it's people from Tajikistan. I love Gordon Badakhshan and the, uh, and the mountains over there. Uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and the whole idea of the world being where it is and just being extremely fortunate, being able to travel all, all across you know, a bunch of different countries around the world. I, I left there, came to England, spent a few months there. Then came to Canada, uh, lived with my uncle for a, a few months, and then uh, my parents found jobs. And we, I mean, normal immigrant story. We just started our lives and, uh, and uh, extremely grateful to Canada for allowing us to come there. And that was a, a wonderful trade for our family. And from there, I moved to the US. I was at the University of Waterloo, uh, got my- uh, we're, we're gonna just pause there for one second because I actually want to dig into that University of Waterloo phase of your life. So you decided to go off and study actuarial science of all things at the University of Waterloo. Yep. <clears throat> and you were actually the youngest um, person to be admitted to the actuarial society in Canada at the time. Tell us a little bit about how you chose that, this, that, that, that particular career pathway. I mean, why, why actuarial science of all of the things? Is that like a big thing in Mombasa everyone was talking about where you grew up? Uh, as an immigrant, I had a very simple and easy path to follow. I needed to find the job that paid me the most money so I could help in supporting my family. Back in the 70s, the highest paying job in Canada was that of an actuary. So I went to the co-op program co-op job that paid the highest salary and I, I just followed the money. It was really a simple equation. We needed to get ourselves out from the lifestyle that we lived at and I felt responsibility to the family and I was the eldest son. So, so your, your career choice in that particular instance was more or less driven by the financial need and that responsibility of helping your family then? Yeah, I mean, I'm also very greedy, so I love money, and uh, that's the place I made the most money. Fantastic. And then from there, your life takes some twists and turns, because you, you didn't sort of end up in the, in the field of actuarial um, work, necessarily. You ended up becoming an entrepreneur. So tell us about that story of from, un from, from graduating and becoming one of the youngest actuaries in Canada to then setting up Canexa in, in 87. Tell us a little bit about what happened there. So we were, we were extremely fortunate. So when I graduated, I went to work for a company called Mercantile and General Reinsurance, which no longer exists. And they had a great benefit, which was in the days of 18% mortgage rates, first mortgage available was 3.5%. So 
I ended up buying a house by borrowing money on my credit card and my parents bought a house on the same street. And then interest rates dropped dramatically. And as we all know, cost of ownership is based on interest. So the real estate values increased dramatically. And because the real estate values increased dramatically, what had happened was in a fairly short period of time, the equity in my parents' home was sufficient to pay off my mortgage. This gave me the ability to take care of my parents. So we were able to give them the house, they paid off the mortgage and it kind of liberated me and allowed me to follow my dream, which was basically to be in a, I don't want to use the word entrepreneur, but to be in the business world, because if I'm in the business world, I have a lot of freedom. I have a lot of choice. I have the ability to do what I want to rather than what my boss tells me what they want done. And so that, therein began the entrepreneurial journey. And I ended up with uh, in a bunch of different businesses over the years. So Connexa or its predecessor, Raymond Carson, was one of them. But I've probably started about 10 or 12 companies, most of which failed miserably in my belly up. And, and I guess we, we, we come from a community of, of people who are also entrepreneurial, right? I mean, you, you, you come originally from, from a part of, of, of India, from Gujarat, where entrepreneurship and trade and, 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 and business is almost in our DNA. Do you think that kind of drove you to setting up your own business in some way as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. My, uh, my grandfather was what was referred to back in Kenya as a Dukawala. So... Yeah, why Connexo? Had... <clears throat> why Connexo? Tell us about the name, tell us where that came from, and then we can talk a little bit about what the business actually was. Yeah, I think these, are, these background noise. Yeah, we're going to try and mute them as we go ahead, so we'll see if we can... Yeah, but I'm getting muted along the way as well. So oh, okay. you, I'm going to keep an eye out on the mute, so if yeah. you could unmute me, or I, I don't know if there's another way, but I'll keep an eye out. If you see my lips moving and no sound coming, it means I was muted. Uh, Sounds good. The question was, you jogged my memory again. Uh, I was just asking about Connexa. Tell us about the name Connexa, where that came from. It was, it, <coughs> the name Connexa was just a made up word. It was in the 2000s. The company had started before I bought my partner out. We were rebranding, we'd sold up a whole bunch of divisions. And basically, Connexa was a startup where we got rid of all our traditional services business and moved more into the product, product arm of the company. And we kind of, in those days, you would dream up words, right? Like Google was a dreamt up word. It, you know, Google is spelled differently. It means 10 to the power 100. And then that math concept is used for search. Yahoo was yet another hierarchical organization. It was a play on words. And so in, in those day and ages, uh, it, was, it, it was a trend for tech companies to dream up names. And, and so Connexa was one of those dreamt up words. And it's Connexa become more and more common now. You see that more and more. Uh, my, uh, I think the biggest starter of that was Microsoft when they came up with the word Outlook to explain that. It, there's no such word. And, and from there on, it, it took off. And Connexa went through a couple of sort of iterations and evolutions. Maybe you can talk to, through that a little bit and, you know, before we sort of land on where you, where, you, where you kind of really took off in a big way. Yeah, the, the, you know, it, it's, it, it's really interesting because most people assume that the pathway is like a straight line up, right? When, when, when you hear stories of people that have quote unquote made it big, all you see is this line in the rear view mirror that looks like a line that went straight up. And the best analogy I have is if you're in a plane and you're, you're seeing a mountain, you see it rising a particular way, especially if you're flying into it. It looks very smooth and beautiful and uh, pleasant to the eye. 
what you don't see is the shrubbery and the crevices and the wild animals and all the dangers that exist before you get out of the jungle and you, you climb to the top. And, and the story, this is not just Conexa's story. It's not just my story. It's a story of just about every one of my friends has the same story. You fall into a number of different crevices. In my case, I was insolvent three times, uh, uh, bankrupt almost twice. The papers have been filed and but for the grace of God, I would have gone there. Uh, and there are lots of twists and turns. You have competitors trying to take you out. You have uh, clients suing you for kind of what was perceived as your fault. You have employees that you have fights with. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a journey of hardship, nor is it a journey of comfort. It's a journey of tremendous level of life and energy and engagement and pain and joy. And you're, you're, you're basically feeling all your emotions at an extreme. The joys are extreme, the fears are extreme, the sadness is extreme. So you're really living in a world of extreme. And the companies, you look back and then you kind of do the strategy. Smart people like you, Farouk, look back and say, this is what they did right. This is what they did wrong. And, and I, I remember very clearly, I was speaking at Wharton, uh, which is a local business school here in Philadelphia. And it's, it's part of the Ivy League. So it's got a pretty good reputation. And, when I sold Connexa, it was the largest tech exit out of the Philly area. And so they wanted to do a study and they wanted to look at it. And then, you know, they were asking all these questions about the strategy that was used in the book. Finally, I said, fuck it, I really don't know. It's just like, it was like, this is what happened. I had to respond to this and this is what happened. And I had to respond to this. And looking back, you can patch a strategy and say it was smart. But the reality of the situation was, there was a tailwind. I happened to see an opportunity or two, like I have in my entire life. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. And it's a hell of a lot of luck. It really boils down to it's a hell of a lot of luck. And you happen to catch the right wave at the right time and it didn't mm -hmm. break at the right time and you got washed to shore. And you know, I stand on the shoulders of the 99 people that didn't make the journey. I was one of the fortunate few that made the journey. It, Success in startups always, always, always underestimates the power of luck. There is an enormous value of luck there. So, I, I, can, I mean, I can relate the story, I can relate the strategies, I can relate the decision making, but I yeah, would say actually, it's all. I'm, I'm interested in none of those things. I'm yeah. interested in none of those things. I'm actually interested in trying to understand. And I, and I say I'm not interested because this has been talked about. You've, you know, you've, you've, you've spoken about the Connexa story in different forums. Rather than talking about the story of the trials and travails and tribulations of an entrepreneur, what I really want to talk a little bit about is in your head, from actuarial services to human resource management, help me to think that through. What happened for you to say, this is an area I know nothing about, but I think I could actually do something, something cool in this area. How did that happen in your head? I knew I didn't want to be an actuary because even though I was doing extremely well financially, even though I was, I, I was promoted at, at a level that was faster than most people or most of my peer group. What I realized is that there was a hunger for adventure. And my wife, at the, at the, at, look, when I was, I'll tell you this as an aside story because it will maybe give you a little bit more context. When I was growing up, I was a geek. And when I was in my adolescent years, I swore that nobody would ever want me as a spouse, right? And so I had resigned myself to that world. 
when I was, when I moved to Canada. And then my wife Sharon fell in love with me. We were 17. And that was a real liberating moment for me because somebody actually loved me for who I was. It was a really, for me personally, it was a very dramatic event in my life. It was a time of freedom and liberation. And basically that event made me feel like I had arrived. And so, and I mean, we're still the best of friends. We've got two kids, three grandkids. Uh, we travel a lot together. And she, I mean, she is my best friend, right? Uh, but what had happened was Shivan had a love for travel. She just loved to travel above everything else. She is absolutely the most non-material person you know and doesn't care about money at all. So when, when we were belly up, she would be able, we, she actually fed the family for 60 days with no money. I mean, between coupons and government stamps and she took care of all of it. She can live off fumes. She, even today, yesterday, I saw her cutting up an old bed sheet. I go, what, what the hell are you doing? I'm making rags. I mean, that's who she is, right? But I think that's an important part of the context because at that point in time when I felt my parents had been taken care of and my wife loved adventure and I loved adventure, it was time to go on one. We were both great prof professionals. She was an ultrasonographer, I was an actuary. The whole idea was to go on a three to five year journey we would experience the US and then come back home to Canada, to Toronto. That was, the, that was the genesis of the idea. The genesis of the idea was parents are taken care of, let's go have some fun. We both are great income earners. We'll get to see the whole country. We might say make some money, we might not, but that's okay. We'll just have a good time. That's how it started. That's how basically I got into my first business. It was, it was really an adventure. It wasn't a plan to make a gazillion dollars. It was just, we are fortunate, we're blessed. We don't have a lot of obligations. Our first kid is born. This is, this is the right time. You know, if I earn a little bit of money, we've got a little bit saved up and then off we go. And so we had like, whatever it was, 20,000 or 25,000 in those days saved up. We moved to the US and we began our journey. And, and then you fell into this space and you became obsessed by it, this area of human yeah, was, development. And yeah, it, it, tell, me, it was, tell me a little bit about why this was a big deal. What did you learn about human resource development? We'll talk about what, what you learn about human beings, but tell me about what you learned about the sector. What did you learn about the field? And you spent so once a I began, century in this space. But once I began the, okay. Fear is a constant companion of mine. If you have an immigrant background, and, I, and, I, and I've had this conversation with numerous immigrants, right? The ones that make that shift, you're always afraid you're gonna get kicked out again. You're always afraid you're gonna run out of money again, okay? So I'll tell you the story and then that'll give you a little bit more context as to how that journey took place. When my parents, when my parents were given the house, right? My first piece of furniture we had in our apartment in Toronto was when my brother and I went down to the incinerator, got a used carpet, got some used toothbrushes, cleaned it up, and we had our first piece of furniture in the house, in the apartment in Toronto. <laughs> and so what I said is I never want to go through that again. So in my parents' basement, I put in a box spring, a mattress, a carpet to signify that I have enough. And I stuck in 2000 bucks between the mattress and the box spring because it would pay for first and last month's rent. And that's, that's what we were gonna come back to. That was my security blanket, okay? That's how we began the journey. After I sold Conexa and I liquidated and made tons of money, when my parents aged, when my parents aged and they wanted to move into a condominium, my mom wanted a smaller condominium of two bedrooms. I got a third bedroom. In the third bedroom, I put in a box spring, a mattress, 2000 bucks between them and a carpet. Cause I still think I'm gonna lose it all. 
Okay, so let's put that in context. Then I can explain how we went. So if you really think about the journey, there is two very extreme driving emotions. A tremendous amount of constant fear and anxiety and a tremendous need for adventure and the ability to fly and growth. So one piece is grounding me and the other wants to fly away. And it was the battle between those two things, which was a more important battle than the battle of how the hell did you pick human resources? The reason I picked human resources is that in, in Canada, a, a lot of people are familiar with this, but th there is the icon. And the followers of the icon are referred to as the smileys. There is, this, there is a basic ethos in that tradition of what is called seva or service. The whole idea of service liberating you as an individual and making something bigger than your own life is very much an ethos of the community together with spirituality. And so that ethos of service was the foundational ethos of the company, which was serving humanity. And in that journey, what, was in, what I discovered, I think accidentally was initially an opinion and then backed up using research was this notion that engagement at work was a fleeting but important dimension in the lives of human beings. And that it was such a powerful idea because if you were engaged at work, you would be a better parent, you would be a better spouse, you would be a better community member. And Conexa's dream, when Conexa was basically founded, which to me was the rebirth of Conexa was in 2001, the ethos there was serving humanity through engagement at work, because that would be our contribution to society. So it's technology, tailwinds, it's the, it's the opportunity to serve and then develop a strategy in order to find customers. And then we realized that we built products and part of my background, I, I mean, I was a programmer as well, like most actuaries are when they get their designation. So I was one of the first engineers that built the first product. So I did that myself. I, I can't code work beans today. Uh, but going back, whatever it was, 30 years ago, I was in that kind of actual hands-on mode. So okay. that's how that happened. Got it. If, if we can just zoom in a little bit so that you can explain to people in, in, in simple words what Connexa was actually doing. What, what was the big deal about what you had just created? The, the big deal about what we created was you lived in a world that was transitioning from an analog world to a digital world. And people in large companies that wanted jobs, wanted jobs filled, and people that wanted jobs, in a very, very convoluted and difficult process of meeting the criteria that existed for these larger companies. They would have headhunters in there and they would have HR departments and all of these things that really, really slowed down the hiring process. So what Connexa did was basically streamline that process, develop technology to compress that time, allow it to be a tighter and more engaged relationship, and then all the services and products around that basic notion, including employee engagement and training and learning. And it was related to what was referred to as the employee life cycle. So for the lay person, it was, Connexa was basically an organization that helped or other companies, our clients, to hire, train, and retain their employees. Um, <clears throat> what did you learn about human beings through all of this? As, as, you, as you spend a lot of time in this area, you know, what did you learn about people? Mm -hmm. I wish I could give you a simple answer to that. You might want to hit mute or all of them while unmute to a lot of background noise. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Is that any better? Uh, yeah. Uh, I would say 
what I learned is there are no rules. What I learned is human beings are mostly emotional beings pretending to be rational beings. What I learned is that we are incredibly resilient. Uh, just an interesting data point. I was born in 1957, which was the same year that the S&P 500 was established. Today, more than half the Americans that were born in 1957 are alive. S&P 500 had the 500 largest corporations on the planet. Only 13% of those are still alive. The average human being is more resilient than the 500 largest companies on the planet. So it gives you, an, I, I learned about human resilience. I, I learned the importance of meaning in life, that most people look for that. When, when, when you're leaving school, you're thinking about your job. You're hoping for inspiration. You are looking for a way to change the world. And in today's day and age, I think it's a lot worse than that because it's gloomy. Uh, but human beings are extremely resilient. If I, if I had, nature is very, very, being very, very, very kind to the species. It's extremely cruel to the individual member of the species. So as a person, I'm extremely different than you for in certain key areas. But in general, we may be the same. And so those key areas is what gives us our individualism. And so we tried, like, at one point in time, Conexa had 100 IO psychologists, of which 70 were PhDs working for the company. If we were the largest employer of PhD IO, industrial organizational psychologists, because we were trying to model the human mind, trying to model the human characteristics and attributes to create models for hiring and training and retaining these employees. And the final answer, if I look back, is we were unsuccessful in modeling human beings. So we struggled really hard and there are lots of books and lots of uh, people that talk about different models and everyone's convinced that their model is the right model. What I've learned is I've as yet to see a model that makes sense to me. And I have literally seen hundreds of them, some in beta stage. It's just like, so if you try and say, what is it about humans that make them special? I would say humans are extremely resilient. I keep going back to that. And we are remarkably flexible. I want, to, I want to dig into one particular facet of this relationship of human beings. So, you know, at, a, at its peak, Connexa was in 22 countries. You had over 2,000 employees. You know, you, you touched the lives of 150 million people. The largest companies in the world were your clients, some of whom were on the S&P 500. This relationship between a worker and the employer, employee and the employer. If you just zoom in on that to help us understand from your 25 plus years of experience, what did you learn about that dynamic between the employee and the employer? Is it a paternalistic relationship? Do they see this as a form through which they get approvals? I'm not putting words in your mouth. I want to hear what you have to say about this. <clears throat> At its best, it's a symbiotic relationship. At its worst, it is a parasitic relationship. It's parasitic because the employee needs to create margin for
for the employer to continue employing that employee. So if you think about a parasite in your body that takes away a part of your nutrients, the employer is taking away part of your productivity for its margin. So that's at its worst. It's symbiotic at its best because it allows the employee the opportunity to grow and learn while creating its own destiny. And it allows the employer to gain from the attributes, talents, skills of the employee. So, so paraphrasing your first point, it's literally, you know, taking the monetization of your labor or skill, paying you a portion of it and pocketing the difference. That's correct. It. Okay. If, if you pause for a second and think about the way we as a species grew up, right? Let's forget about the hunter gatherer phase because that's too far in our past, but let's look at the time when we were shifted from hunter-gatherers to farmers. And then as we become industrial, and now we're what's called the knowledge society. The, in, in the arguably 20,000 his, year history of humanity as it shifted, in that time we've always worked. But the word job was established in the 1640s as a remnant of the industrial revolution. This notion of a job is relatively new. We work, we don't, we didn't have jobs. The employer employee relationship is primarily an artificial construct to bring about efficiencies. Because if we ran around for our own devices, to our own devices, we would have a highly inefficient planet, probably not have this level of abundance and happiness and everything else that has emerged, which has brought in a tremendous amount of benefit for mankind from my perspective. We are in the golden age of humanity, even today in spite of COVID is my belief. But the employer-employee relationship at its basic level emanated from this notion of the word job. And that's what created it in the first place. But it was no different than us serving the monarchs of old. You know, where the power resides, the citizens serve, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the story of humanity. And that's no different. In this case, the monarchs, the corporation, not the nation state or the king. And the second point regarding the symbiotic relationship, which is, which is a little bit more I, uplifting. It's a different way. I, I can't hear you. Uh, the symbiotic relationship. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. So Much better. Because it's, it's a slightly more up uplifting perspective on this. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about that symbiotic component. So, but let's, let's take a step back from what you said. I'm not putting a positive or negative spin on this, right? Because you, the lens you're wearing says that this one's uplifting and this one isn't. Parasites are also forms of life that are extremely beneficial to society. So I might be using words with a negative context, but they're not meant to be used with a negative context. The symbiotic... Of those words. Let's okay. Let's talk about the symbiotic component. Okay, so the, the symbiotic relationship is more of a relationship which is a relationship of true gain where you can look at the individual and say, in exchange for paying this franchise fee or the utility, marginal utility of my labor, you are teaching me to learn and grow so I can do more of this. And so as that relationship continues to grow and expand and everything else, it becomes a mutually beneficial relationship but it is cyclical in nature, like all relationships are, right? The, the, there isn't a single thing in life that isn't cyclical, in my opinion. And this is one of those cyclical relationships that can either be symbiotic or parasitic, depending on what phase in the cycle you're in. So you went through these, you know, 
trials and tribulations that the entrepreneur identified the right opportunity, the right product at the right time. And in 2012, IBM calls you to a meeting and they say to you, Rudy, we, we you know, would like to have a chat with you. Can you just tell us, you know, I, there's a little snippet that you always talk about, about how that meeting went. Just talk, us, talk to us a little bit about that meeting. Basically, what, what they basically came and said, in a nutshell, is we want to buy you. And it, I mean, I've, I've given the story about what happened behind the scenes, and I won't bore, uh, bore the participants with that. If you're interested, there's enough recordings on that. But the reality is, in that meeting when they came in, this is what happens, quote unquote, in big boardrooms, right? Like you see in the movies. It's nothing like that, guys. It isn't people wearing suits and ties. I'm sitting there literally in my pants and a shirt. An unexpected visitor comes in from IBM who's representing a service, the head of the services that we have partnered with and basically comes into the room with somebody else who says, we want to buy you. And if we don't buy you, we're going to go buy your competitor. Basically, that was the message. They didn't use that language. They, it was very pleasant, but it was an iron fist and a velvet glove, which is generally how these things work. We're bigger and stronger than you. We want to buy you. If you don't sell us, your life's going to be miserable. That's the, the opening line. You make a lot of money, sell us the company. And my reaction was, okay, let me think about it. I'll get back to you tomorrow. And indeed, you chose that choice and made a lot of money. The, the, it was a record deal, $1.3 billion for your company. And you walked away. And I guess it was a transition phase, maybe a bit of a no compete. I don't know what it was, but they said, hang on, work with us for two years, help with the transition, and then you're a free man. Yep. Somewhere in that period of time, you decided that you wanted to write a New York Times bestseller book. The very notion of writing a book in and of itself, you know, implies that you have something that you think is important to tell the world. If you had to summarize this, you know, if we're not we're not trying to diminish the sales of your books on Amazon, maybe you know, spike. But if we're trying to summarize for people, what was the big stuff that you wanted to communicate in your book? What would that be? It was again, one of those fortuitous events, right? So it was before I sold to IBM, it was in 2009 and my wife had won the Fulbright. So she was in Al Ain in the UAE for a period of a year, fulfilling her obligations as a Fulbright scholar. And I was in the US and so I used the weekends to write the book basically. So we would see each other once every three weeks uh, which was generally me going down there or meeting somewhere in the Middle East. And over the weekends and in the evenings, I basically wrote the book. And basically the message that I wanted to give was twofold. And that's, even though it was a bestseller, when I look back, that was a fundamental mistake I made in the book. I had two audiences. I wanted to tell the corporations, basically engagement is really important. And I wanted to say to the employee, here is the way you want to think about your career. From what all the research that I've done, from everything that I've seen, here are the two basic notions. And because I believe that I was trying to give two messages, the book wasn't as good as I thought it could have been had I just had a single message. But those were the two messages. And to the employer, it was, this is why engagement is important for you. And this is what you can do as suggestions to improve it. Uh, if you're an employee, here is the way to think about your career. Think about it as a career bullseye. Here are the three things you got to think about as you chart your own career. And that basically is the headlines. Very interesting. And, and what are those three things? The, the three things are basically the three P's. Passion, pay, and purpose. Be passionate about what you do, but don't tell anyone about it because no one else cares. The passion will create the emotional drivers within you so that you can function at your best. Understand that you're an economic engine as humanity always has been. 
and don't pretend like it doesn't exist. There isn't a higher calling than the calling of basically not being a debt to society or your parents or to people around you. Find a way to get paid. So make sure it, with your pay, make sure you spend less than you are. And then put your passion towards some sort of a purpose in life. Because that is the, ultimately the thing that will sustain you. Your passion will ultimately burn out because, and will change. The purpose can be something that's true for you and basically have that purpose drive you. Got it. I'm going to come back to that in a bit because, you know, your, your life takes a very interesting turn. You know, you've just walked away with a $1.3 billion deal. <clears throat> rather than riding off into the sunset to enjoy your wealth, Rudy, you go into this incredible period of soul searching and agony where you're trying to figure out what you're gonna do with your life next. I mean, just this makes no sense to people on the outside. You're a, a gazillionaire. You've just made the, the most ridiculous deal ever possible on the best possible terms. How can you not be celebrating every day? What, what happened? Tell us a little bit about this phase of your life. It, was, it really was a very sad period of time. I cried myself to sleep for three weeks. One of the, for me, what's very sad is when death occurs because it's so final. Even though I accept it as part of life, death is a sad part. And that doesn't mean I remain sad forever, but I have the privilege of mourning through sadness. The sale of IBM brought three deaths to my life. I had three goals when I began the Connexa journey. The first one was to be a billion dollar company. So I had that financial aspiration. The second goal was to make employee engagement part of the vernacular amongst the decision makers. And the third one was to be worth over you know, pick a number, 100 million bucks. That was the number I, I, I picked for myself. Employee engagement went from being measured by 8% of the Fortune 500 at the time we began the journey to 65% of the companies were, employed, were, were measuring employee engagement. We were the largest provider of that and the hiring systems and everything else fed into that. It was worth a billion, over a billion. And I made more than I had wanted to. It, it basically killed me. I was extremely sad because I had three deaths simultaneously. All my three goals and dreams and aspirations were all met. And it lo life lost its meaning for me. And that contributed to the sadness. And even today, when I recollect that period of time, I can still feel myself choking up a bit because I was really, really sad then. It is absolutely impossible for somebody not in that position to understand because it is a time of tremendous joy and abundance and wealth and freedom and all those other things that we as humans aspire to. And you go, this guy's gotten there. What an idiot. Like, I mean, he's gotta be, he's gotta be the stupidest person on the planet. But that human aspect of watching yourself melt away and die without a sense of purpose left anymore, without a North Star, without the ability to kind of wake up and be relevant was all gone for me. And that was really hard. That was the, that was the difficulty that I had. Would it be fair to say, Rudy, that you kind of, out of your three Ps, you, one became meaningless because pay was no longer important and the other two Ps were completely lost for you? I never thought about it that way, Farouk, but you're right. I lost all three Ps at the same time. I, I, it never occurred to me. Thanks. That's why I love doing these things, right? Because I learn new things here. Right? 
more importantly, I learned a little bit about myself. Because the journey, you know, when I was young in my 30s, I spent a lot of time trying to change the world. Now that I'm old and calcified, I only worry about changing myself. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for the wonderful gift you just gave me. You, you showed me a new lens in which to look at myself. So I, I really appreciate it. So you go to this period of introspection, reflection, you're a pain in the ass to everyone around you, your family, you just, you know, just miserable, you know, lounging around in your pajamas at home, just, you know, just not a pleasant person to be around. And then you kind of figure something out and you decide Carlani Capital. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Was that the vehicle that kind of helped you figure out the pathway from, you know, from where you were in, in, the, in the doldrums of, of your own introspection and reflection? Was that, was that kind of what Carlani has done for you? It was a little bit, it, it was, one of the gifts that IBM gave me, they don't even realize this, was they allowed me to stay there for 18 months in the guise of transitioning the company, which do you remember I talked about symbiotic relationship between an employer and employee. This is a perfect example of a symbiotic relationship. They needed from me the ability to integrate uh, Connexa. Because I know you mentioned those 2000, but there's actually like close to 4,000 employees in around the world, lots of relationships, you know, whether it is the Saudi Arabia or China or whatever, even though IBM did, had their relationships, we had a lot of relationships that they didn't have. Integrating all those global relationships, the employees, all those things took time. What it did for me is it allowed me time for grief. It allowed me to kind of calm myself down and ask myself, what is it that I really want? So in that journey of discovery, and anytime I'm in a journey of discovery, I always start at the base level, which is show me the data. First, show me the data. And the data was, what are my options? So I interviewed for a couple of Fortune 500 CEO roles. I looked at private equity uh, uh, types of roles where I could be a partner or what have you. And what I discovered in that process, what I discovered in that process is my North Star had shifted. The North Star that was around engagement and money kind of combined together, or I should say uh, wealth creation was probably a more accurate way, or maybe even a deeper way of looking at it is elimination of fear. Because the wealth was that elimination of that immigrant kid that didn't want to go back into the basements incinerated to collect the carpet. That was the wealth. And the service was the ethos that I grew up with. And so I translated that to money and engagement. But what it did was allowed me to go back on top and say, it's all about service. And I just don't want to feel scared and I just don't want to be hurting and I just don't want to cry. So what stops me from crying and what makes me relevant? Uh, that's where I got to. And that will form the genesis of our life. Right. And you know, I truly believe that you know, when you've got to that level of money in your life, that level of financial freedom in your life, um, you know, there's an impolite way of saying it, but when you get to that level of, you know, goodbye and thanks for all the fish level of money. You know what? When, when the character of someone really begins to show out. And, and I'm oh. curious about the things you've chosen to do with the investments you're making through Kalani. What, what are the things that are having you, that, occupying your brain space? You know, you give the, your time towards them in Kalani. Tell us a little bit about the, that, uh, the portfolio of things that you're looking at today. In, and, in and the, it's, 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 it's a hypothesis. I, I don't know whether that's true because I haven't gotten to that threshold, you know, but I believe that when you get to that level of money, 
for which you, you don't have to work anymore. You don't have to worry about it. The, the fear is gone. All of that has been fed. The stuff that you do with your time then speak with volumes about things. Right. So there are a couple of assumptions there that do not necessarily apply to me. So okay. the first one is the fear doesn't go away. The fear is a constant companion. But what happens is the fear becomes a broader fear. It's now I'm scared of the money. It's really weird how this fucking thing works. Like it's like it's it's really difficult to try and figure this out about yourself, right? Because the fear for money never disappears. But I'll tell you what I said at my daughter's when my daughter got married. When my second daughter got married, I only had one request for my daughter and my son-in-law. Please don't bench me. Let me remain relevant in your lives. And so I go back to security and purpose, right? Security and service. And the way I describe that is this yearning to remain relevant. And my children really did something. They, so I'm really close to my children and grandkids and like my family is really important to me. And they, about seven, eight years ago, they gave me a wonderful gift. Through their actions, I no longer owned their problems. And they liberated me by saying, I don't owe them anything anymore. I've completed my role as a parent. I only now enjoy the fruits of my journey as parenthood. So this notion where you're only as happy as your least happy child doesn't exist in my life. I don't own my kids' problems anymore. And my kids liberated me through doing a couple of things. The first thing they did was they became extremely self-sufficient themselves because they were given the advantage of great education in the Western world basically gives you a ticket for great jobs, right? So they had that. And my elder daughter now has got her own startup and she's, she works with me part-time on Carolina and my younger daughter is the same thing. I mean, she, she, just gra she just graduated from Harvard Business School. So she's got all that pedigree. So she's just, both of them are doing very well in the materialistic sense. And that liberation of not owning my children's happiness anymore was very, very, very liberating for me because I realized at that point in time. And the second gift they gave me was to show me that I had no power over their happiness. I had no power over their lives. I could only now basically embrace it and be a part of it but they were on their own journey and I was a passenger on that journey. And so what that created for me is, well, what is it that you want to do? And all I want to do now is just have a good time. My number one driver is joy. So I take what I believe is my purpose, which was to change the world, is now to change myself that has shifted. And what I find that creates the greatest amount of joy for me is learning. And then I don't want to hurt people because business by its very nature, it takes margin. And in my parlance, it means you're taking something away from somebody or you're trying to kill a competitor. The competitive spirit still remains, but I don't want to be the one doing it. So I've taken the chicken way out and said, somebody else do it and I'll fund you while you're doing it. So it is a, some, it is a little bit hypocritical from that perspective. Okay. Uh, but I'm comfortable with that hypocrisy. Yeah. I'm comfortable with that inconsistency. And then yeah. basically from there on, I just go looking for investments, and they can be wide and varied between eliminating or reducing financial exclusion, helping the, helping the, for lack of a better word, the working poor improve their credit ratings. So you come up with innovative ways for doing that to 
changing the planet so you can refill the aquifers in the Sahara by creating the submersible desalination units that use very little energy and creates no pollution. Like, I mean, those are the wide extreme of investments I look at and have participated in. And I find entrepreneurs that are soulmates and I ask their permission to be on their journey. And if they give me permission, then I sit in the captain's cabin with them and think of me as the old grandfather sitting in the corner with, 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 with his pipe and says, ah, you know what, that wave looks a little strange. I think we're in for a tornado. I would pull down the sails, but it's entirely up to you. And it's your choice whether to listen to me or not, simply because I've seen those waves a hundred times before. Yeah. And I think that that sort of philosophy definitely resonates, you know, when I, when I kind of looked at looked at Kalani and what they're trying to do, I think that philosophy resonates in terms of that appreciation of the, of the entrepreneurship journey, not wanting to be a parasite, but really, you know, using your skills, your knowledge, your experience to help other people succeed. I think that resonates really, really strongly. But when I look across your portfolio, yes, you know, there are these incredible um, ideas that you're pursuing. But, you know, when I also look at some of them, they kind of go back to this area that you've spent 25, 30 years in around this human resource development. And one of them is, you know, what you're doing through Phnom people, the idea of help 1 billion. I want to go into that area because it kind of takes us into where we see a big wave happening in terms of the transition of, you know, the human cloud organizations beginning to outsource using the capability of having these intermediaries send out work to different parts of the world by atomizing tasks it seems to me like you still have a bit of a passion. This is an area that still resonates with you strongly. Can you talk a little bit about that, that, that space at all? There is, we are as a species going through an incredible level of automation. Automation of what we do with our hands or with what we do with our body and automation of what we're doing with our mind. One we call artificial intelligence, the other we call robots, but they're both doing the same. And when you think about it, it's every organ of the body is being robot, ro robotized, including the brain, but we have chosen to de-link those two. You can take a position, someone like Ferrari that says, with this, and sorry, just, just for the people who don't know the reference, you're talking about Yuval Harari, who's written the book Sapiens and so on. We'll, we'll make sure I'm sorry, yeah. As well. Yeah. <clears throat> that this is going to be the death of humanity because humanity will lose its sole purpose of being economic engines. And that humanity as we know it will disappear. There will be a few very powerful people surrounded by robots who will then ultimately take over them. That's his basic thesis, right? He's a historian trying to project forward. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for it. One of the smartest people I've ever met. Or you can take the other extreme, which is to say that will happen, but there will be other journeys that will come in. You never reach the top of the mountain because in the process of climbing an infinite mountain, every peak is a vision to the next peak. In the story, that I choose to believe of humanity is that it's an infinite mountain, that every peak we get to basically shows the grandeur of the future peaks we, we, we run into. And so what Phenom People basically does, and a lot of these companies that I basically involved in, is basically playing the thematic area, which is what we consider full-time jobs are in a bear market not just in the United States and Canada and in the Western world, around the world. What is on an up market and an upswing is the ability to be resilient and find different ways to do the job. And basically going back to our roots as hunter gatherers and farmers where we till our land, develop a special, specific craft uh, and, and continue to be, be who we are, both who we want to be and who we need to be which are two different beings. Being that wants to be is different than the, need, the, uh, the human that uh, uh, needs to be. So that portfolio basically says three things. It says, 
how can I make more money than the money I've already made? Well, why would you want to do that? And the answer to that is just because. Because if I don't have some sort of a marker, how can I deem whether or not I'm still relevant? And I haven't figured out whether that marker is wealth or something else. And I haven't figured out another metric yet. The second thing it does is it keeps me relevant. Uh, if I have a need to be relevant and there are these extremely smart entrepreneurs, extremely successful human beings that give me a position in the captain's cabin that I can nod off to sleep when I want to and be relevant when the right wave hits, my God, what, what an incredible opportunity. Why would I want to give that up? Right? And I get that second feeling of relevance yeah. and everything else. And the third is to be at the leading change and watching the story unfold at the ground level. So let me give you an example because you mentioned this. One of the stories is a company called Phenom People, right? And Phenom People, basically what it does is it takes this employer-employee relationship and brings about friendliness and humanity through this exchange. Because large companies are very difficult to deal with now if you're an average customer or if you're an average employee. It, because you go, to, go through these all these AI algorithms and life just becomes miserable. If you buy a product and try and get customer service from a large company, it's really hard, right? And so they try and make these products as, as, as faultless as possible, as perfect as possible. And companies are fairly successful in doing that. But if you think about it from an employer-employee perspective, what Phenom People does is it humanizes that relationship. It allows you, uh, it allows you the ability to interact and do that with kind of very, very large corporations in the world. But the fundamental reason for its being is to help a billion people find the right job. That's what Mahi, the founder, believes. Okay? And he and I have had long debates whether it's to find the right job or to find work, but let's leave that aside. Let's put that aside for now. Okay. COVID hit. Come back. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's okay, go ahead. COVID hit, right? And, and both Mahi and I have spent, like, I probably spend five to seven hours a week with Phenom people, roughly. Call it a day a week is, is, is the amount of time I spend with Phenom people. So I spend a lot of time kind of working with the people there, researching it, helping them think through various things, and in some cases, helping execute as well. Uh, the question then became, is all these, you look around and everyone's pulling their hair out. What's going to happen? There's going to be these major, major apocal type catalytic events that are gonna take place on, on, on the planet, right? There's gonna be climate migration that's gonna come in. You know, the weather's gonna change, low-lying areas are gonna do this, that, all these things are gonna happen. Uh, the second thing that people are worried about is all this automation is gonna create this enormous, uh, elimination of all these jobs. And then this wealth disparity is gonna create these tremendous levels of uh, discontinuities and fairness on, on this planet. And I was talking to Maya, but I go, look, Maya, look, everyone talk about what they want to talk about, right? But why don't we do something instead of talking about it and worrying about it? Because the problem is always their problem. It's the government's problem. It's my neighbor's problem. Why don't we make it into our problem? Why don't we do something about it? And Mahi is just a really gifted entrepreneur. So he came up with this idea called Help One Billion. And it's basically a rollout of the 60 million people that emigrate from the rural areas to the urban areas in India that are looking for a place to basically earn a little bit of money so they can feed the family. And they don't know how to find 
75% of the work in India is created by organizations with six people or less. So how do you take this incredible inefficient system and add a level of efficiency to bring it all together? And so we rolled it out and this for-profit company is not making any money. It's giving the software away for free. It's going, you'll hear about it if you're in India, probably in the next three to five years uh, as it starts to roll it out. And will it work? I don't know, Farouk. But will I put a lot of time and energy trying to think it through and make sure that the edges aren't as, as sharp as so to hurt people? Yeah, I'll spend a lot of time worried about that and thinking about it. But the reality of the situation is we'll probably try and do something. And if, you know, a million people decided to do something, great things would start to happen. If a million people said it's not your problem and it's my problem, and I promise to take care of it, or at least do my best to take care of it, I think life would be a lot different. Uh, but that's just uh, just a personal point of view. Yeah, uh, but there's one other thing that, that sort of feels like a bit, a bit of an epiphany for you, Rudy, and you've talked about this before, and I think it's an important one as we, as we talk about the future of work, and that's this distinction between work and job. I want you to just, you know, share, share a couple of, of, of thoughts regarding this so that there's a bit more clarity in terms of, you know, how you see the distinction between those two. And I think it's a really important one to, to try and describe a little bit better. A job basically is where you put a predominant amount of your time in a fairly all-inclusive contract with a party called the employer, which basically says, I am dedicating most of my life in your service for the period of time I choose to be there. By that, I mean, you know, greater than 50%. Most, by my definition, is greater than 50%. So I'm, I'm, that's, to me, a job. Work is putting out my labor, whether it's intellectual or physical, in exchange for money, which is goods, at my behest and at my control rather than at your control. That to me are the two big differences. And, and do you think we're, we're getting them confused now? Yeah, I think so because what's gonna, what, what I think is going to happen, if I was a new graduate today, I would start thinking about how do I create a portfolio of many jobs to use the nomenclature that currently exists as a way for me to meet my purpose, my passion, and so that I get paid, rather than saying, let me go get a full-time job somewhere. Because the idea of a full-time job is in my world, the riskiest economic path you can take in today's day and age. It is the path of the turkey that's being fattened before Thanksgiving. Life is blissful for 364 days and then the ax comes and you're dead. Yeah. And I think there's one more element. Go ahead. There's one more element you and I talked about, you know, when, when, we, when we're having a conversation, you know, uh, I come from a Gujarati family, so do you. And, you know, one of the things that, that we really appreciate is when you have a Thali lunch, you know, when you have a lunch where you get a little bit of dal and a little bit of the vegetable curry, a little bit of the potato curry, you know, some pickles and some, some papadum and some rotis. And that smorgasbord that you're able to create really creates, uh, you know, satisfies your appetite. Could we think about what we do with regard to our careers in a similar way? So if we can't find the three Ps aligned in one particular area, could we potentially take on a series of engagements curated to our own point in life, wherever we may be, whatever point of life we may be in, to be able to get the three Ps coming out? Sometimes you may have a passion, but payment doesn't come through there. Could we potentially think about that as the way in which we will grow our careers from now onwards? A series of mini engagements on our terms, 
to either draw the passion, the payment, or the purpose? Yes. I, it, from a from two individuals like you and me, where you are very smart and somewhat and probably totally liberated. I am somewhat wealthy and totally liberated. From an academic standpoint, it makes perfect sense. And that's the journey the two of us have gone on, right? We have had the joys of the variety of spices and the way we feed ourselves. From the lens of the person that is coming out of school, that really doesn't understand that, I would say to you, we are both looking at the same thing that Farouk and I are talking about from two different spots. The spot you're coming to is aspiration to get there. And in the aspiration to get there, just understand what we are saying is going to materially affect the way your life, the arc your life will take. If you can conceptually understand what Farouk said was the atomization of the workforce and viscerally relate to it, the quality of your journey could be remarkably powerful. And so I would say I 100% agree with you, but it's really difficult for me personally to use a lens that makes sense for you because your view of the world is so much different than mine, even though we're looking at the same world. So if you are kind of coming out of school or you are in school right now and you're thinking about your careers, replace the word career with atomization of my life. Think about, don't think about work-life balance. Think about juggling. Think about work-life blend. Break it up, break it up, break it up. Uh, because If you, if you go into this world of jobs, you can do extremely well. And you can be, you can be, you may be able to follow your destiny there, but you're entering into a world that is going through a massive secular trend where jobs are reducing. As long as you're aware of that and you enter it, you're entering it with your eyes wide open, good luck to you, God bless you. But understand, you are just entering a world that's that big, is, is got these waves. This is what's happening in this world from where I sit. This is what I see happening. It's getting closer and closer and smaller and smaller because this bear market has lasted for about 20 years, and I see no end in sight. There is another world which is going like this. It feels very small and dangerous right now because I don't have benefits and I don't have this and I don't have that, but it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Those are the two terrains we're in right now. I just wanted to share one observation before I ask you my last question and I want to open it up. You know, as we were talking about this whole um, cycle of the industrial revolution and we were sort of designing this course, Yogesh and I had to sort of pick a starting point. And we decided, you know, we would talk about what was happening to how human society was organized before the industrial revolution. And then, you know, try and help people build that narrative arc. And one of the things that came up very strongly was the idea of peace rate work, which is what happened when production was never centralized in a factory or in a central unit, people would work at home, you do your knitting or you do your embroidery or whatever else, people would give you the raw material, you go off and do it on your own. 
and then you'd have somebody come back and collect it. Our argument is that we're literally going full cycle again. We went through four industrial revolutions just to end exactly where we started because the need for having centralized production, the need for having people converging in an office or a workplace is no longer valuable. So atomization of work is essentially going back to piece rate models where everyone's a freelancer and you have engagements with different people who require your talents, your services, the products that you produce. And that is essentially the world that we're going into. I, would, I wouldn't be able to disagree with that hypothesis. Fair enough. Last question, because we've been talking about circles and I want to open it up. Let's go back to the beautiful white sandy beaches along the turquoise blue water of the Indian Ocean in Kenya, where you grew up. As you're walking along the beach, you meet the youngest version of Rudy that you can remember. They're just starting out in life. They're trying to figure it out. What advice would you give them? I would look, out, you... at the, I would look out to the ocean and I would tell them the story. I was growing up in Mombasa. I know you see this fat, pudgy figure in front of you right now, but I used to be a competitive swimmer to the point where I won the Kenyan championship in breaststroke. And I was training to go into the Olympics. That's how good a swimmer I was. And in Mombasa, we only had two pools. So a lot of my practice was taking place in the ocean. I want you to hit pause for a second and think about the ocean and the waves. Because in today's world, change is coming through at a terrifying pace. However, we have longer lives, we are wealthier, we're safer, and no matter what metric you want to use, look at, we are really in the golden age of humanity. Now, picture that together with the waves and let me finish the story. Because when I was training in the ocean and I was 13 years old, I hated the waves because what they would do is they would tire me out, they would make me drink the brine and the salt water and make me almost throw up. I just freaking hated these waves. But every morning I'd go out there and train and I'd discipline. And one day with the grace of God, I learned how to ride a wave. And now when I was training, I would catch that wave. And when I hit it right, I would feel this feeling of flying. Riding this wave would break the bonds of gravity. It would get me closer to the creator. It would create this enormous joy in me. And no matter what happened, I would still get tired and hit the and drink the brine and feel sick and exhausted. I loved the waves because it gave me that one opportunity for that undescribable joy. And so as I look to your life going forward, my thoughts and prayers are, may you learn how to ride the waves of change the way I learned how to ride the waves in the Indian Ocean, standing right here, right next to me. Good luck and God bless you. Fantastic. Rudy, thank you. There's, there's a few questions. If, if you're comfortable with it, we'd like to open it up and you know, we, can, we can continue until people feel like they've had their questions answered. Okay. Yogesh, do you have anyone teed up for us to begin? Yeah, uh, th there are quite a few questions. Uh, one of actually uh, was asked twice and, and you kind of asked that question, Farouk and, and Rudy already, already in some ways answered. Uh, so it's it's about uh, you. You came from 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 Africa, and then you said that when you arrived here, it was like a dream world. Um, but who's some someone who is still there in in Africa at the moment, and and they have to take this journey without coming here. 
how would that that be? Uh, in in other words, would you be able to do the same thing that you were able to do here, back back in that emerging economy context? The honest answer is I don't know. Uh, I am extremely blessed. So life has treated me exceptionally kindly. I don't know what it would have had in store for me there. Like I am really a firm believer that I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors and I am here today because of their prayers. Without that belief, I don't know where I'd be. So with that belief, I, the answer is obviously not, but what else could it have been? I don't know. Mm -hmm. There was one more question, uh, Rudy, around, so you talked about uh, engagement and, and employee-employer uh, relationship and, and your learnings uh, of, of starting um, a company. There was one question around, how do you actually engage uh, the millennials? But now you can broaden it, then Z and, 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 and broadly youth. So how do you actually motivate them in, in, in that relationship? So I, I would say that it depends whether you're looking for an individualized message or a message at scale. A message at scale is the one that leads to engagement. The pillar of engagement is responsibility. And at the responsibility level, you, the youth, have to understand what your responsibilities are. And one of your responsibilities is to get engaged with life. Now meet me in the middle. Show me a way, teach me what it is in your life that engages you, that is realistic within the constraints of what I have in the organization. And let's develop something on a mutual pathway. So that to me is a tailored message at scale, depending on the organization and the way you would ask the questions and tell the message. At an individual level, I would define engagement as something, the goal is the path. You personally putting yourself through a path of engagement you've reached your destination. So what the employer can do, what I would do with that specific employee is help them understand how the path is the goal. Get yourself engaged. And this is what the company will do for you in exchange. So Yogesh, I do have a hard stop at 10.30 because I have prior commitments. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I think we, we, uh, we will wrap up, uh, Rudy. It was an amazing session. I mean, everybody else in the chat is saying it's so enlightening, so inspiring and motivating. So I'll let uh, Jamie uh, do a proper thank you. And and from my side, it's, it's I mean, it's a perfect yeah. and And, and uh, this could not have been better for, for us. Um, this is Thanks for the opportunity to serve. Bernadette, Bernadette, I just want to say thank you. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Bernadette. And, and uh, I know you only have 20 seconds, Rudy, but thank you so much for sharing so deeply with us um, all of your experiences, your stories, and uh, you've left many of us thinking about things differently and having opportunities for our own personal reflections on what you've been able to bring through your story. So thank you, we're very grateful. Thank you to all of the participants um, who've been with us through our journey over the past number of weeks within our first certificate around the future of work and workers. We are better for everything that you've brought uh, through your own experiences and your learning with us and to those who've been part of this larger webinar series journey over the past number of months. We're grateful for your participation. Look forward to continuing our engagement with all of you as we continue through 2020 into 2021 and the future that that will bring for all of us. Thank you. And again, Rudy, uh, we're very, very pleased to have you with us and wishing you all the best and continue these conversations with you uh, as we continue to move ahead.
So thank you. Thank you to Farouk and Yogesh. We're grateful to all of you. Be thank well, you. everyone.